Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you today about Oregon's innovative uh, uh, effort for improving childhood success, which really is a core uh, priority uh, of my administration. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, a sustained and strategic investment in children ages uh, zero to five is an absolute key to achieving our state's long-term educational and economic objectives. And I especially want to thank uh, Swati, who played a very key role in my transition team on early childhood and family investment that has created uh, a report that lays the groundwork for, I think, an, a remarkable new integrated approach to early childhood investment and success. And I hope you'll take the opportunity uh, to go to our website and take a look at the report. It is really uh, quite an elegant uh, a document. It offers, I think, a very practical blueprint to uh, unify a number of desperate programs and services to streamline administrative costs and to actually measure outcomes in order to ensure that all of our children are not only ready to learn when they arrive at school, ready to read when they enter the first grade, and are actually reading uh, when they lead, leave the first grade. Uh, Oregon, like just about every other state in the union, is facing a, a serious uh, economic challenge. We've got a, a stubborn uh, high unemployment that's hovering around 10% statewide. We've got a $3.5 billion budget deficit, about 20% of the general fund. But unlike other states, we view this as an opportunity. Uh, and I intend to use this crisis as an opportunity to take on the kind of deep transformational system changes that simply are not possible during good economic times. Because I think the opportunity in the budget crisis is that it's becoming increasingly clear to more and more people that the only way through is to innovate and change our old systems and apply them to the new realities that we have to face. So we've started with a shared vision, and the vision's pretty straightforward. Uh, by 2020, by the time the kids who are in kindergarten today graduate from high school, we want a state where all of our children are in fact ready to learn when they come into school, that they're reading when they come out of the first grade, that graduation rates are going up and dropout rates are going down, that every child with an Oregon high school diploma can enter post-secondary education without the need for remediation, that at least 80% of those kids get at least two years of post-secondary education and training, and at least 40% of them get a baccalaureate degree or higher. And we've driven the per capita income in our state back up above the national average in every region of Oregon. Now, we're using Oregon's budget shortfall to, uh, as an opportunity to improve the way the state does business. And we have to act right now because I'm increasingly convinced that many of the challenges we face in the 21st century are based on the fact that our delivery systems were designed for the realities of the middle of the last century. And they're simply not sustainable, whether that's public education, whether that's health care, whether that's public safety. Because the fact is that even a robust and recovering economy cannot keep pace with the rising cost of medical care, with the rising cost of social services or public safety services, or the fragmented, siloed way we seek to educate our children and prepare them for success in the 21st century. So Oregon is going to fundamentally change its course. And our new approach uh, to early childhood investment and success is the foundation, is the absolute foundation for a broader set of educational and social service and economic development strategies that will bend down the cost curve of public services and make our state more competitive uh, in the global economy of the 21st century. Successfully investing in the developmental needs of early children is the key to shifting our state spending from dealing with problems on the back end, the results of abuse and neglect and, addic and addiction, to investing in people and education on the front end. So the problem that we have in Oregon, and I expect in many other parts of the country, is that far too many of our kids uh, lack, the, or at least are growing up, without the family and community supports that are needed to be successful and independent uh, learners. We have about 45,000 children born each year in Oregon, and 40% of those children are exposed to one or more easily recognized socioeconomic or physical or relational risk factors that adversely affect their ability to acquire the foundations for successful learning. And we all know what those risk factors are. Uh, teen pregnancy, poverty, unstable family backgrounds, negative peer association, substance abuse, uh, cr uh, criminal uh, records. So overcoming those challenges that we know about, that we can identify, that we actually know how to address is the key to avoiding and having to pay for 
the downstream costs in the public safety system and in our social support system, and freeing up resources to reinvest in people and in the success of citizens. So the problem that we face is that the early childhood services that we have in our state, and we have a lot of them, they are neither integrated uh, nor are they accountable. And we've got to change that if we want to effectively and efficiently prepare our kids for school and to reduce, reduce the social costs downstream. So in Oregon, we spend almost, and it's not a big state, nor a rich state, we spend almost a billion dollars a biennium on children programs uh, zero to five across six state agencies, dozens of different programs, many of them connected to county counterparts. They are not co coordinated. They don't measure outcomes across the programs, and they're not connected to the K through 12 system or to the larger healthcare system. The average cost of treating a child in the system is about $7,500 a year, and less than half of the estimated children who need services are actually getting them, and only 25%, maybe 30% at best, of these at-risk kids are going to meet state reading benchmarks in the next two years. Now, that's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable morally, and it's certainly not acceptable to spend a billion dollars in this economy on a program that produces those kinds of embarrassing outcomes. So here's what we're going to do. We've targeted three areas uh, for policy and system change to achieve the goal of ensuring that every child enters school ready and able to learn, that they're ready to read when they come into the first grade, and that they're actually reading when they get out of the first grade. So first is early identification and support. So in that area, we need to uh, identify those kids and families for those critical indicators of risk. We need to establish neighborhood catchment areas around elementary schools uh, where a family support manager will coordinate the support services needed by these families and, and children. The second area is shared measurement and accountability. We need to convert the current contracts with every single one of our early childhood providers to performance-based contracts with accountability for reaching very, very clear defined goals. We also need to require outcome measures across all the early childhood domains, child health, child language, literacy and learning, social emotional, cognitive development, family support, and development. We need to adopt a kindergarten readiness assessment as a part of this program, and we need to deploy a statewide child-based data system that allows us to track expenditures and return on investments and make sure that we link the health and school readiness data to later school experience. That's the second area. The third area is budget and governance. So I've proposed creating a early learning council to coordinate and streamline the existing funding and program streams with a director who has a cabinet level position in the governor's office. Last week, I named a design team that will begin working immediately with the stakeholders throughout the state to have a model up and running by the second year of the biennium. We're targeting July 1st, 2012 to have this program up and going. Furthermore, we've set some very ambitious, uh, but I think very achievable goals for this new delivery system. First, within two years, we want to be serving 60,000 children, which is a 50% increase. Second, we want to make sure that at least 70% of those children served meet benchmarks for kindergarten and first grade reading by 2020. Third, we want the average cost of the child served to drop by about 30% to just over $5,000 a year. Finally, the Early Learning Council is just the first step in a much larger strategy to create a transparent, seamless, performance-based, zero through 20 education system from very early childhood to post-secondary training and education that provides better outcomes for our children, provides more resources for our educators, and produces a more prosperous future for the state of Oregon. Now, the fact is the changes that we are proposing are certainly significant, and many of them are going to be very difficult to achieve. There are a lot of people attached to the current system in, in a lot of ways. And the success in committing to early investment involves getting beyond the inertia of the status quo. So we're going to need to engage our stakeholders at the state uh, and the national level to help us share and implement a new successful approach but it is one that I am absolutely convinced can become a model for other states that can deliver better outcomes for kids and much better value for taxpayers. 
We're looking forward to partnering with the federal government in particular to get the flexibility we need to develop an outcomes-based system and to allow us to merge federal and state dollars towards clear, clearly defined outcomes in an accountable model. Let me say finally that the philanthropic community uh, certainly has a role to play. And I am uh, unabashedly in telling you that we need your assistance and support, uh, A, by endorsing our work, uh, second, by spreading the word among the networks that you have, third, assisting with uh, public education, with communications, with social marketing campaigns to help us engage Oregonians and educate them about the importance of this and this once in a generation opportunity we have here to leverage this budget crisis into something profoundly important and effective for the future of our, of our kids assisting us with the transitional costs, including the infrastructure we need to develop the statewide tracking database that's central to this effort, and supporting research and policy development and pilot projects. Let me just close my remarks here by telling you this is really gonna be hard. <laughs> it's gonna be hard because the, 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 the tragedy here in America is that we are a uh, just in time, want it right now society. And you can't show a return on investment with resources you spend on kids in the normal legislative budget cycle. So when we're faced with a three and a half billion dollar budget deficit and I wanna pump up investments on the front end, it's a tough sell and I need help to make that happen. But if we can't do it in Oregon and if we can't do it now, we're gonna miss the train. Because when this economy starts to come back, Everyone who's invested in this old system is going to say, you know, we can hold on just a little bit longer and, and we'll, it'll be okay. We can't give them that chance. And let me leave you with a story uh, by a guy named uh, Kim Stafford, whose father was the Oregon Port, uh, Poet Laureate. Kim is a teacher's writing at Lewis and Clark College. But I think it captures, it's a metaphor for what we're trying to do. What we're doing is planting a seed for tomorrow. And we need to make people understand that without planting that seed and nurturing that seed long before it ever breaks the ground and way before it ever blooms, we can't realize the future that we want. And this story is called Lloyd's Story. It's a true story. Uh, Lloyd Reynolds, the international citizen of Portland, spent his last days silent, unable to write or to speak, lying in a hospital bed. On his last day at home, as his wife scurried to pack his suitcase for the hospital, Lloyd made his way outside to the garden, and there she found him on his knees, awkwardly planting flowers with a spoon. Lloyd, she said, you'll never see those flowers bloom. He smiled at her. They're not for me, he said. They're for you. The salmon coming home, they're for you. The call of the wild geese, they're for you. The last old trees, they're for you and your children to the seventh generation and beyond. They're all blooming into being for you. That's what we have to communicate to people, my friends. This isn't about a little more money. This is about changing the future. And the hard work starts now, next week, next month, in the next six months. And I'm here to ask for your help. Thank you very much. Thank you.